So welcome, um, Bill and El Fadar. We're so grateful that you're both uh, talking with us today about this very important issue and um, wondering if we can kick off with, um, if you could give us some context to what's happening in the Uyghur homeland since 2021, the US government has called the actions of the Chinese government a genocide. Um, how do colonial boarding schools fit into the larger picture of that genocide? Sure. Uh, Bill, you want to go first? Oh, no, you <laughs> go ahead. Go okay. Ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. First, I would like to thank for, you know, giving me this opportunity to speak about the Uyghur genocide. As you know, we are on the seventh year of this uh, China's genocide against Uyghurs. Uh, how did it start? This uh, assimilation, discrimination was started since we were invaded in 1949. And it was slowly, you know, working to basically we had our prosperous states we had our country before but then once chinese communist party came took our land sophisticated and confiscated the land took our jobs you know destroyed the livelihood of uyghurs and then slowly cultural genocide were happening however recently starting 2016 2017 um president xi jinping and chen Chuanguo accelerated this genocide because they wanted to resolve the uyghur issue uh, as creating one homogeneous Han Chinese population. So uh, Uyghurs won't be on their way for their uh, one road, one belt initiatives, you know, economical, you know, uh, incentives. And for, they wanted to have a firm grip of, you know, control in the region so they can continue what they're doing. So by, uh, from the state, eliminating Uyghurs and eradicating them uh, was the solution. That's why it got speed up and accelerated recently. And uh, Uyghur children's role in this is the kids are our future. Uh, so by um, using the genocide, they transferred millions of Uyghurs to inner China to factories to work on the forced labor, slave labor. Uh, and by doing that, they separated the parents, right? And millions of Uyghurs were also taken to the concentration camps. They call it re-education camp, but concentration camps, really. And they are also being um, away from their family. So I was wondering uh, what's happening to the kids, but uh, they are also part of the genocide. They're sending, they're being sent to state-run orphanages, kindergartens, and uh, boarding schools. So they're away from their family, away from their, you know, culture strip, being stripped away from their language, their identity, their culture, uh, and basically being raised as a loyal subject to CCP. Uh, so this way, China can accelerate the genocide. Our future is at stake, right? Our future is already destroyed and being like a Han Chinese, uh, homogeneous. Uh, uh, nation and then the existing ones are already in the camps. They already arrested our uh, backbone of our society first: the writers, the doctors, the professors. So this was a big picture, basically. If I could jump in, the um, the parallel is the CCP has also taken in the elders of the Uyghur people, the, the grannies, the grandfathers. And so it's a, it's a two prong. So the, the cultural carriers, um, the wisdom elders of this amazing people group um, on one hand have been arrested. Many are in their seventies. El Fadar will know many stories of, of the parents of U S based Uyghurs. Um, in in the concentration camps, so so the parallel then to the younger kids, um, and we have to tell our listeners that um, we're talking about children as young as four years old for preschool. So it's been highly documented that um, in Tibet, which is a very similar situation, um, the four 
to six-year-olds um, pre-K here in America um, have been taken in by the tens of thousands. So if if you just all think of any four-year-olds, I have um, a granddaughter who just turned four, and the idea of her being taken from her parents at this stage of her development is just um, is just so un- unacceptable. So from that age all the way up through through high schools, and uh, just to give some figures, um, by 2016, 2017, there were half a million um, Uyghur. Um, and when we say Uyghur, this includes Kazakh, Kyrgyz, Uzbek, the smaller um, Turkic minority peoples, Hui, as well, in the, um, the Uyghur homeland. And... Uh, Published Chinese internal documents have put that figure uh, almost doubled now um, in 2019 to to 900,000. So it's a huge um, number. Um, we should describe um, this is a, a audio podcast, but if we were doing PowerPoint, um, we could show you slides of what these camps look like. They look they have barbed wire around them. They have um, armed guards. Um, they look like prisons and very grim places to, to have children um, living and being educated. My goodness. Well, thank you for, um, yeah, thank you for providing some of that context. Um, we're hoping that you can tell us a bit about the recent NPR reports about um, Uyghur boarding school survivors who are in Istanbul? Um, Sure. Um, So I I would like to talk about the Kuchar family that was on NPR's Emily Fang's report that the Kuchar family uh, visited Urumqi in 2015 and their passports were seized, confiscated, and after two years, only father was able to return to Turkey. He was deported, basically. Uh, but mother was taken to the concentration camps. And the two kids were sent to two different uh, kids' boarding schools. So their daughter, Aisu, who is six at that time, and son, Lutfullah, who is four, they were forcibly separated from their family and relatives, like grandparents and other relatives of the family. And they were sent to to different boarding schools. And they spent, uh, based on what I, you know, uh, from the report, they spent 20 months there. And eventually, because of their Turkish citizenship and uh, father's advocacy, uh, kids were released. Uh, By the time they were able to return to Turkey as their home uh, around 2019, they were able to say bye to the mom, but mom was still in the concentration camps. So maybe they will never, ever be able to see, you know. And they came to Turkey, and uh, in Turkey, they forgot, their father realized that the kids forgot their own mother tongue language, their Uyghur culture. And also they used to speak Turkish. They forgot that. And they had a lot of health issues too, like malnutrition, like no iron and calcium, not enough getting, you know, deficiencies basically. According to the children, they were in the boarding school. They had very bad situation. It wasn't like a school as uh, Bill described it earlier. It's more like a prisoner prison, you know. Their heads were shaved, for example, when they enter it. You know, they didn't have control of their own hair. And then the teachers and then the usually older students are assigned as a you know, to monitor the class and the dorms, you know, at night, they frequently hit the kids and lock them in dark rooms in the basement of the buildings and force them to hold stress positions as a punishment when they didn't follow the orders, such as uh, speaking without permission or using Uyghur words, you know, they were getting uh, punished. So for both children, the mental trauma took years and years in Turkey. They visited psychologists um, they, for months. Uh, they were asking permission uh, for going to bathroom or eating food, you know. And when there are guests, they were hitting the guests. Like they, they were not 
raised like a normal children. And they quite often they used to have, a, you know, nightmares and kicking the beds or door and screaming that I don't want to do that and things like that. So uh, this is the Kuchar family's story, uh, even though, uh, you know, it is sad, but actually they were the good, the happy story because Kuchar family, the, the uh, Kuchar family was able to unite in Turkey, right, without the mom, but at least kids were safe and kids were in Turkey uh, because their father was able to get them. Um, so, but some parents, you know, are not that lucky. They find out their kids' videos on the social media on, you know, but they can't bring their kids because they're not citizen of another country. So that is one of the report on the NPR. There was a 2019 BBC report that uh, our listeners can, can Google um, BBC. Where is, where are my children about um, John Sudworth, the journalist went to Istanbul and interviewed families um, like El Fadar just described who were, um, who had children in these um, boarding schools, but could not get them out. And the anguish, um, there's a, there's a video that accom- accompanies the, the article. Um, and it, it's heart wrenching to, to hear parents describe um, their kids. What makes the Kuchar family so unique and, and please um, go back, our listeners, go back and, um, and Google NPR, Emily Fung, and hear the, hear the, the broadcast. Um, is that they're they're so far the only boarding school survivor children that we have. We have a number of of concentration camp survivors now that have made their way to the U.S. Um, that are that are in Washington D.C. Um, El Fadar works with them. Um, they frequently speak to the public. Um, but these two precious children in Istanbul are the um, our only source so far. Uh, so we can just imagine the, uh, if they're representative of the trauma. And so we just have to underscore that the Chinese government knows and understands that these conditions are traumatizing to um, now an entire generation of Uyghur children. And, and they have to answer yeah. for that. Yeah, I, I want to add that these are just among thousands of stories of the Uyghur parents whose children are back home, you know. They live with survivor's guilt already, and the fear of seeing their children left behind are not with the grandparents or the relatives, but in the Chinese boarding school or state-run orphanages, even though their parents are alive. And they're turning into, like, robotic Han Chinese. And what's very scary is, you know, China intends to strip Uyghur children to destroy destroy the hope, fate, and soul of our people and destroy our past and future. And this is the part of the genocide, basically. Yeah. Um, Thank you for for giving us these insights. And it is so, so heartbreaking and heart-wrenching, like you both said. And I think um, at the same time, it's so important and good that we do have these testimonies so that this information is being um, brought into the light. And um, yeah, just such an egregious violation of humanity that is so important that we're we're learning about this and understanding it. Um, So last year, the Department of the Interior slash the U.S. government published a major report detailing the 150-year history of U.S. federal boarding schools um, for indigenous children. Why is this this history relevant to the current boarding school policies in China? Right. Becca, thank you for asking that question. It's uh, the day after this report came out, the Chinese foreign ministry held a press conference. And in the press conference, they lambasted uh, both the American and Canadian governments for um, our two nations' history of indigenous boarding schools. Um, 
So to back up with some highlights from the report, um, uh, Assistant Secretary Brian Henley says that um, that these schools were very specific. Um, they, he calls it, um, and the U.S. government has now called our own history cultural genocide. And everything that Elfadar described earlier, um, they they did in. I should say we. It's, be, it's best to say if if you are an American citizen or a Canadian citizen, we should use the language we. Um, and this this um, includes our Uyghur Americans. We have we have ten thousand Uyghur Americans. So this is this is part of the history for our Uyghur American listeners that uh, as you've um, joined this incredible fabric of our nation, that um, this is this is our common history and we need to to in some ways take the the lid off this painful chapter our indigenous brothers and sisters are here in strong numbers now and recovering every year from the trauma of these um this 150 year history so when the when the children went into these schools and um their hair was cut just like with the Uyghur kids um they were given new names and absolutely forbidden to speak their um, their indigenous language, whether it was Hopi or uh, Puebla, um, um, Zuni, uh, Arapaho, any of these amazing languages, uh, if you spoke them. Um, and it's interesting, some of the punishments were exactly the same. Um, solitary confinement, bullying from the older children. Um, we have a whole host of survivor stories uh, that are available. Um, you can Google them on on, um, on YouTube, um, Native American um, boarding school survivors. And, and you'll hear story after story of the trauma that these camps um, caused um, many generations. Um, and I think they all agree that the worst, the worst, most egregious um, damage of these camps was taking away the language of, so that when these children got out, uh, went home to the grandparents, they couldn't speak to the grandparents in, in their heart, the grandparents' heart language. And so I think this is, this is part of the, uh, what Elfadar described about the Kuchar kids. Um, they hugged their daddy, uh, but they couldn't speak Uyghur or Turkish um, to their dad, or if they don't think they could even see their grandparents. And so this is what um, is so unacceptable. It's already happening with the Tibetan children, of whom there's a longer history here. Um, so acknowledging our nation's um, both Canada and the U.S., our history helps bring, helps mitigate the cause or the charge of hypocrisy. Uh, the Chinese government charges both nations with hypocrisy. How can you speak to us when you've done this to your own people? But what we're saying as a nation, and Canada's already done this on a larger level, is um, truth and reconciliation commissions funded by the government that that accepts the responsibility um, that says we did wrong this was this was evil this was terrible we're sorry and and they're taking concrete steps with with money to to address that the US is is following behind there's some bills in congress right now that are addressing this issue Thanks, um, I think Bill explained it very nicely. Uh, just to add to that, yes, it is a sad part of the U.S. history, the Canadian history. Uh, however, uh, the difference I see, you know, with what the CCP is doing is, um, at least those Western countries, they're uh, not denying, uh, and they are accepting what they did, and they're also taking steps to like apologizing or giving them more rights. I, I 
agree it's not enough, but at least they are given some rights. And today's world, they are being respected and people study history, they know. However, it's uh, opposite in China. Um, they will never, uh, you know, accept what they're doing and they think that is the right thing to do and they will use a propaganda to, propaganda to uh, justify what they're doing. Uh, it's it's just sad, and I want to be hopeful, but I don't see the light in the tunnel. You know that they will do that in the future. It's just I think no human being should be um, you know treated that way. I hope no one has to go through this kind of you know s- treatment. Uh, I hope it will change. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we hope and pray it will too. And I just um I want to go off script for just a second because I'm I'm reflecting on um something that I think I'm I'm curious to hear from you both about, and I think might be important to distinguish between um like Chinese people and what the CCP is doing, just mm-hmm. given the context of. AAPI hate in the U.S. and discrimination against Chinese people to be able to clarify, like, on the one hand, that what this the Chinese Communist Party is doing is is weaponizing culture and is um, its policies are are oppressing Uyghurs and other people, but to know that that's not the same thing as the Chinese people or Chinese culture. And to also, I'm curious to hear from both of you, like what have you found to be helpful in terms of Chinese allyship? Um, if that's even something that, that you've seen or, or what that looks like. So sorry to throw that at you, but I'm really curious to hear um, about that. Um, from my perspective, uh, yes, we do know that it's the Chinese Communist Party who's doing this, and it's their agenda, their intent to, uh, you know, continue to, you know, persecute and, you know, holding the genocide against the Uyghur people. Uh, because of their propaganda, uh, honestly, most Chinese in China, you know, they don't know what's going on in that uh, they are also, you know, presented as, oh, those are radicals, those are extremist terrorists, and we are treating them and re-educating them, and those are schools, and that's the propaganda they do. Uh, that's why uh, I can't blame, like, the innocent Chinese citizen. However, uh, as far as they know, they should question their government, they should request uh, to stop this mistreatment because it might come to them that for, according to the Chinese government, anyone who's against the government is, you know, uh, is a threat and is needs to be punished. So uh, there is no freedom of speech, freedom of, you know, religion. So uh, they need to be treated well as well, or they need to speak out about the Uyghurs. Uh, but I do see recent white paper protests, as you know, after the uh, big fire in Urumqi during the COVID lockdown. People were locked from outside and they couldn't escape and they were uh, they died uh, by the fire. And the most Chinese realized this could happen to them as well. And it kind of bring up like, uh, you know, the protests all over the China and they were able to you know, stop the zero COVID policy and change it. So looks like uh, there is some hope from their end to wake up. They need to follow what's going on. Uh, They need to read more. Uh, And basically, I'm more mostly talking about the Chinese in back home. And for the overseas, yes, we do uh, have, you know, allies. Like we always have... Uh, work with um, Tibetans, Hong Kongers, Taiwanese, and you know, in many events, and even for Chinese, and we hold in you know, a multiple white paper, you know, in universities, Uyghur students hold uh, protests together, demonstrations and vigils. So uh, I think it will go in a positive way if everyone knows their responsibilities and act upon instead of just watching. 
Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Oh, Bill, did you want to add? Just one of the things we've been waiting for is um, we have at least 4 million Chinese heritage Americans um, in our country, which is a, that's a large group of our fellow citizens. Um, and this, this issue of um, justice for, for Uyghur families, in this case, the children, it just has, it has not caught on um, yet. Um, and as a, as a white male, I understand um, as someone who's been dealing with systemic racism in our nation, our nation's um, racial past, it's a big step. Um, for us, us white Americans to accept that there's um, systemic racism um, throughout our country's institutions. So I, I understand that that kind of emotional step that um, that Chinese Americans are are being invited to. This is an invitation. So if some of our listeners are from that that um, demographic, please just welcome to the table. We're waiting for you. Um, and in many ways, I'm um, one of the strongest institutions in uh, among Chinese Americans is the church, both Protestant and Catholic churches. And so for those brothers and sisters, um, this, this issue is often um, classified as a political issue. And many of those churches don't want to get involved in political issues. But um, I think what Elfadar and I would push back on and say, this is not a political issue. This is a human rights issue. This is, um, these are families with stories like the Kuchars and so many others that need people of, of goodwill, men and women from all backgrounds, to stand up and push back um, against the genocidal treatment of the Chinese Communist Party. Thanks for saying that, Bill. That was, yeah, and, and Elfadar for what you shared, incredibly well said. And um, I have just been reflecting as you were talking about, um, you know, the, what Americans, what we, have historically, um, how we have historically oppressed indigenous peoples and reconciling that past and owning it and um, how that is necessary in order to, to call out injustice um, across the board. And um, <clears throat> and now what you're sharing about um, the, the invitation that's offered to Chinese Americans, to all, to all of us, um, to call out injustice. I, yeah, this, I feel like this isn't going to be well said, but I, what keeps going through my mind is like justice doesn't the call, or at least the call to, to um, recognize injustice doesn't discriminate and it's not um, reserved for one people group. And the onus shouldn't be on one people group to, to like take up that mantle. It's for all of us to, to see something and to call it out. Um, regardless of background, regardless of political affiliation. And I think that's just such a good point about we get, or I know, you know, it, it, it might be easy to get a few steps ahead and think, well, if I condemn this, what does that mean for, what am I saying? What are the like implications for now what I, how I vote? And, you know, but I think it really is pretty simple. Like when we, when we see, and that, that might be naive to, to say it's simple, but I, I see it as simple, you know, when we're looking at mass genocide like so anyways um so just thank you for sharing that and um i the next question is just why 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 is the chinese government implementing this cruel policy um for the uyghurs for for uyghur kids specifically um in the boarding schools uh, I think we mentioned it a little bit in the beginning, but um, so as I said, since we were invaded, uh, we are Uyghurs, right? We are different. We are not culturally, religiously um, same as the Han Chinese. So the current um, Chinese Communist Party and the Xi Jinping, 
they're not welcoming the diversity. They want one homogeneous, you know, Han Chinese nation. And systematically, they had the forced abortion and, you know, the transferring girls to inner China for factories, and those were happening. But I think the turning point was in 1990s when Soviet Union uh, separated uh, to Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan when they uh, broke out. Uh, China realized that uh, they need to be a little harsh on Uyghur issue because uh, we might have the same, you know, feature. And then they got much um, uh, accelerated the process and got much uh, harder and put, you know, absolutely no mercy, you know, eradicate like this harsh policies to basically destroy and eradicate and eliminate the Uyghurs. Uh, Our land is also very important. It's what connects China to Europe, to the world. So for their economical uh, trade, uh, it's very important to hold it under control. And also, you know, our region is very rich with mineral, critical mineral resources. Uh, It's a big land for their population issues, right? And uh, there are a lot of incentives for them to have strong control and own our region. So those are the reason why China is doing it. Uh, Not just a cheap labor, they're also using Uyghurs as... um, or they're using Uyghurs also for their organ uh, harvesting business. Uh, so there's so many opportunities, not just use us by as a forced labor, sell us piece by piece and profit from us. And so all those are included in this genocide, but Uyghurs are totally different in the history and they don't want that to happen again. Um, for the kids, as I said, uh, they want to um, basically destroy the future, and which starts with the kids starting early age of four. If they don't know their language, if they don't know their identity, uh, they can control them much better. Uh, so also, it is also uh, giving us the current generation or older generation is like, I am doing this on your watch, you know, like killing our hopes for the future. So I think that's all part of the genocidal intentional policies. Yeah, if I could add to that, um, back to the Department of Interior's report last spring, one of the things in Brian Henley's report was the federal government was intent on assimilating these children. Um, remember, these schools are assimilationist schools that wipe out the the indigenous cultures of where the children have come from. And but that's just part one. Part two is so that the the federal government could then uh, take their land. So this was at a time when the boarding school issue um, or history began in the U.S. It was very much um, the Native Americans were virtually in all different parts of the country. And as the boarding school um, history went on, their lands were encroached, encroached and taken over. um, And the indigenous peoples um, pushed to to the most fringe, unproductive type of lands. So it had this um, very much an empire type goal of of economically profiting by moving people out of lands. And what's what's eerie is that we are seeing now um, photographs of from the Uyghur homeland of whole villages emptied people are not not in their homes and and then um an invitation to, for han chinese migrants to to move to move in um the han population of of that area 
is of the Uyghur homeland is is growing every single day. Um, 1949, uh, the Han ethnic group was only 6% Mm -hmm. of the total population. And many of those were soldiers. And, and now, um, now it's well over Elfadar over 50% now. Yes, around 60% now, unfortunately. So that's also diluting the population while transferring Uyghurs to inner China, bringing more Han migrants into our region. And uh, a lot of <laughs> behind the scenes. I, I wanted to add one more thing, Bill, uh, is the forced marriage issue, because starting 1980s, um, China had the one-child policy, and then they were doing millions of abortion when the child the kid, child was a girl, so they can continue their last name, right? And then that caused for very big imbalance in the population because there are like eight to 10 men to one woman. So therefore they had state uh, sponsored incentive plans to basically asking Uyghur women to marry Han Chinese. So if they accept, they'll get awarded, they'll given house, jobs, uh, some money. If they don't accept, their parents taken to the concentration camps. They have, they might face to taking being taken to the forced labor camps or concentration camps. So poor Uyghur girls, they're sacrificing their life and marrying Han Chinese uh, to save their parents from the camps. And once they do that, you can see our future also will be you know Han Chinese population with the birth and forced marriages. Uh, that's another way of you know. Uh, having uh, the genocide besides the forced sterilization and forced abortion. With sterilization, they're killing our future kids before they are even born, right? So it's like, uh, it is very harsh, you know, genocidal policies that we have to stop. Uh, Otherwise, this threat will... uh, spread to the countries around. There's surveillance, you know, monitoring police state running, you know, government will also spread to Hong Kong and other Taiwan and other countries. And eventually China is telling the African countries or Islamic countries or the other third world countries that look with this system, communist system, I am being successful. I'm powerful economically. So you can do it too. So use those hick vision cameras to monitor people uh, their daily life so you can control them well and then you can be strong to most of the dictator uh, dictators in the world. So that's very dangerous. That is a threat to the world. We need to do something about this to stop. Yeah, thank you so much for illuminating that. And I know that was um, a question of why some Muslim and African countries don't declare it as a genocide. And um feels like, yeah, you just answered that basically. Um, there and... being silence with the economical, you know, uh, incentives, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Um, so it's the government, you know, not the people. So people should speak up more, raise awareness, and like social media has a strong role in this, you know, even though media is controlled by the, their government. And every time we, when we have... Um, panels or we have like university tours, we have fate house tours. I tell the people from other countries, contact your government, tell them what's going on. We can make changes. We can change this and stop this. If we all as a human, you know, get together in solidarity and take steps. Yeah. One of the most exciting recent stories um, of a concentration camp survivor being let out of camp and then repatriated to France is Gobahar Hatawati. And um, she has two uh, amazing husband and and then two activist daughters who tirelessly, uh, when when their mother was in the concentration camps, uh, did a social media campaign in, in France to pressure the French government to use diplomacy to get their mother back. And uh, she's just come out with a, with an excellent English language book. Um, and my wife's reading it right now. Gobahar, um, and um, Elfadar, she's coming to the U.S., is that right? 
That's correct. Next week. So she will be here in D.C. for a couple events and uh, New York for a couple events and then California. So you all should. And those camp survivors uh, were the lucky ones because they're, you know, husbands or kids in citizen of foreign country. You know, they advocated for their freedom and finally had some sort of agreements with the Chinese governments were able to release. So that just highlights citizen diplomacy. That's we should yeah. never say um, this is too big an issue. My I don't matter. No, that's not mm-hmm. true. Uh, we can become wise yeah. consumers. One of the issues that is um, widely used now to to counter the the genocide is understanding that that Chinese textiles, anything made with cotton from China has been tainted by forced labor. And so uh, we're trying to keep keep track of that. And so for our listeners, uh, please don't buy textiles from China because there's a good chance that there's been Uyghur forced labor to pick the cotton and then secondarily uh, forced labor in the textile factories. so there's there's things that we can do. Thank you, Bill. That that was actually my next question: is what can we do as everyday ordinary people to be who are pursuing God's shalom or peace in the world, and um, how can we be good allies? And yeah, so if, if you have any other thoughts or <laughs> practical tips um, for our audience about about that. It would be great. Um, for this, I think everyone of us who have as a moral responsibility to take what little action we can take to push and pressure the those power to stop the CCP. You know, the UN should release its report uh, and hold um, hold resolutions. And hold China accountable, and we can contact you, and we can call, we can write letters. Uh, besides that, there are other bills in the U.S. for the U.S. citizens, uh, Uyghur uh, human rights. Two bills passed already, so we are very thankful to the U.S. Uh, and then the current one are the Policy Act and Stop um, Organ Harvesting uh, Act. So. Those are the you know basic thing we can do. We can contact our own senators, our own uh, Congress members, and tell them I heard about Uyghur genocide, and I want to make sure my you know uh, government supports this. My congressman or congresswoman supports them and co-sponsor the bills or sign the bills. Uh, I think that is one thing we can do. And besides that, um, we can ask uh, people to boycott made in China products. It's better if we purchase U.S. products here uh, or whoever, you know, whichever country you're in, you know, buy your local product. Uh, It's definitely better than buying products made with forced labor, blood and tears of people who are under the genocide. Um, I think those are the things. And support Uyghur organizations. Um, they have events, webinars, some online, some in-person demonstrations and things like that. Support them. Or if you can't go and attend, you can support financially. So those are the things I think we can do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I this this conversation has been so... I think helpful for us as we kind of understand the current context, what's happening not only to um, adults under the genocide, but to children specifically and how um, how horrible and evil um, that is and to understand how we can um, help to educate and spread awareness about that specifically is really, really um, important and meaningful to us and to our audience. So thank you both so much. Um, And would love to give space if there's anything else that you would like to leave our audience with um, before we close out. I wanna say, uh, now you know, 
please share, you know, raise awareness, tell your neighbors, tell your friends, tell your relatives, this is happening uh, in today's world. And we need to do something about this as, as a human being. Uh, we need to stop this crimes against humanity, this genocide. We understand a lot of sad things happening around the world, but, you know, at least we can do is to speak about it, to, you know, spread the word. And this is the stay by the oppressed, not by the oppressor. I so much agree, Elfadar, that, um, that this is timely for, for our listeners, that this is happening right, right now, right now. And our response there are these children in these um, these residential boarding schools, these colonial boarding schools, that uh, are who are they looking to? Uh, their parents are are not able to to speak out, and so if not us, who? If not now, uh, when? So I. Just want to mention the the names of the organizations that uh, that Elfadar mentioned. In um, there's Uyghur American Association, of which Elfadar is the president, and so so there's that one. There's the Uyghur Human Rights Project, um, and there's Campaign for Uyghurs, um, all based in the D.C. area. All have websites. All have information uh, they're all networked uh, so look look them up um, peace catalyst we have our um, we have a small section on our website so this is um, again to close it's it's timely and if you want to do something in your area um, contact us Elfadar mm -hmm. and I will uh, we can organize events, um, organize speakers, and we'll come to you. Thank you. That's wonderful. Yes. And we will provide your contact info in the episode description and, and all of the, the links to those websites. So thank you both so much for your time and um, for helping us to to understand this important issue and to be able to to take practical steps towards helping um hopefully to to put a stop to this um for good so thank you so much thank you Becca. thank you for having us <laughs>